musketeering. I would not breathe totally easily uh, if I were them. But certainly for the moment, it looks as though the uh, DA has made the decision to confine herself to indicting a former president uh, and, and top staff. In Turkey, an urgent rescue underway for American Mark Dickey. The cave expert fell ill and is trapped in a deep cave. Here's ABC's Marcus Moore. Dickey, the chief rescuer on a New Jersey team, now being rescued himself by a team of more than 170 workers. This is a very complex cave rescue operation. need uh, constant uh, medical care. The rescuer is now preparing for the treacherous journey back. I'm up, I'm alert, I'm talking, uh, but I'm not healed on the inside yet, so I'm going to need a, a lot of help to get out of here. According to the rescue organization Dickey works with, demolition teams are working to enlarge the narrow passages of the cave, and rescuers preparing a base camp about 2,000 feet in. It's been one month today since the Maui wildfires broke out. Residents have hard hit Lahaina trying to get their lives and possessions back. Dealerships and car companies are stepping up. Ford is offering thousands of dollars off the MSRP for Maui wildfire victims. Eric Hofer is with Valley Isle Motors on Maui. Every day people are coming in. You know, just yesterday we had three people directly affected by the fire that purchased vehicles that didn't have a car that needed a car. And for those who lost everything, Hawaii's governor is promising 18 months of housing will be paid for in long-term rentals. ABC's Alex Stone, you're... From the KMET Weather Center for Beaumont Band in the Pass area this morning, a clear sky, sunny today, high 96, clear tonight, low 72, excessive heat warning Saturday, sunny, high 100. For the Inland Empire this morning, sky airs will be clear, it'll be sunny through the day with a high of 96. And for Palm Springs, we'll have clear skies this morning with plenty of sunshine through the afternoon, the high 108. This is meteorologist Jim Minaldi for Smart Talk 1490, KMET. Hello, listeners. This is Christopher from The Christopher Show. Hey, if you missed one of our shows here at KMET, don't worry about it. You can go to our webpage, and that's KMET1490AM.com. Go to the homepage, click on the SoundCloud tab, and hear any show anytime you want. The following is a paid program. Views and claims expressed are those of the program producer and are not endorsed by this station. Opinions expressed are not necessarily those of radio station KMET, its management, employees, or affiliates. Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live, blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free live streaming app on Google Play and the Apple App Store. As always, a huge shout out to the team. Mitch, Bill, and Sean, I love you. And to our special advisory committee that can be found at www.scbrtalk.com backslash advisory committee. Learn all about our fabulous team when you log in. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. If you're here to listen to regularly scheduled Dave Ramsey, I want to thank you for tuning in and invite you to join in the one hour California public policy update with Dr. Lanny Chen. Thanks to the generous support from MGR Services, we are here today live and on location with the Lincoln Club of San Bernardino County at Red Hill Country Club. Dr. Lan He Chen is the David and Diane Steffi Fellow in American Public Policy Studies at the Hoover Institution, Director of Domestic Policy Studies in the Public Policy Program and an affiliate of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He is also a presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed member of the Independent and Bipartisan Social Security Advisory Board. Chen is a veteran of several high profile US political campaigns and served as policy director for Governor Mitt Romney's 2012 bid for the presidency. In that role, he was Romney's chief policy advisor, a senior strategist on the campaign and the person responsible for developing the campaign's domestic and foreign policy. Previously, Chen served as a senior appointee at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services during the George W. Bush administration, in private law practice at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher LLP, and has advised numerous other presidential, gubernatorial, and 
congressional campaigns. Chen earned his PhD and AM in political science from Harvard University, his JD cum laude from Harvard Law School, and his AD magnum cum laude in government from Harvard College. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Lani Chen. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Beautiful. So as you know, my first question to each of my guests is to please talk about what inspired you to pursue your career field, in this case, public policy and law. Well, first of all, great to be with you. Great to be here in, in uh, at the Red Hill Country Club. Great to be here with the Lincoln Club. I, it's great to see some old friends, uh, some people who I haven't seen in a, in a very long time. And so uh, it's great uh, to have this opportunity. I think for me, public policy is a lot about how do we improve the situation in our state? How do we improve situations in our communities and in our country? Right. I think there are a lot of things that Frankly, if you look at California as an example, what I see is a state that has had a wonderful heritage. We've done a lot of great things over the years, but we're really, I think, fundamentally punching below our weight right now. We're doing a lot of things uh, that are what I would consider self-inflicted wounds. This should be the best place in the country to grow and invest, to create new businesses, to create jobs. It's not now. And I think we have to ask why. And so for me, the motivation to be in public policy, to work on the issues that I work on, really stems from a belief that California can and, and should do that. Um, my, my own background, you know, my parents are immigrants to the United States from Taiwan. Uh, I grew up in, uh, spent the first six years of my life in North Carolina. That's where I was born. And uh, my parents, I think after six years, figured out two things about North Carolina. One was that it was very far from Taiwan. And the second thing they figured out is the Chinese food wasn't very good. And so we ended up moving to Southern California. I, I was you know, spent the first uh, couple of years out here in a city that some of you might know called Roland Heights. And that's where I, um, I grew up and, and substantially spent most of my time through high school when I left the East Coast. And through it all, I think what my parents really instilled in me was a sense that this is a remarkable country. It's a remarkable place. And really, a lot of the things that were possible for them were only possible here. And so public policy for me, again, is a way to give back. It's a way to improve our state and our country. And we got a lot of challenges to deal with. Right. And so um, one of my first questions to you, uh, Dr. Chen is, you know, if you could draft policy that spurs economic growth and make California a state viewed as a favorable destination by businesses, yeah. what would that look like? Well, we, have, we have to make a lot of changes. <laughs> um, first of all, we have a regulatory and tax environment that is frequently too punitive and it's too unpredictable. I talk to a lot of uh, CEOs, business leaders about what it's like to do business in California. We've got a number of, of business leaders here in the room. And the thing I hear most often is the unpredictability of the regulatory environment, the idea that you don't know what else is coming down the pike. The nature of our system here is one where changes are constantly happening. And the changes, more often than not, are not pro-business changes. So if you look at our tax code as a great example, we have a tax code that doesn't really facilitate the collection of revenue in a stable way. Uh, we have a, a tax code in California that's incredibly reliant on capital gains. And so when the economy is good, when the stock market is good, things look great. We had a governor bragging about uh, a, a budget surplus of $100 billion, only to find that a year later he had a budget deficit of $30 billion. Now, why does that happen? One, because you spend without responsibility to your taxpayers. That's item number one. But item number two is you have a system in place where the tax collections vary a lot over time because as the economy uh, shrank and did not do as well during COVID, what you saw was some real challenges. And those challenges were filled in by a lot of money from the federal government. But when you take that away, again, you create uncertainty. So we have an uncertain and unstable tax environment. And then the regulations. You look at the regulations that we put and how hard we make it, for example, to build new housing. It is much easier to build new housing, new physical plant, new infrastructure in pretty much any other state in the country versus in California. So the lack of a steady regulatory and tax environment, and one that recognizes the importance of creating jobs and businesses here in California. I think I think those are really significant challenges. We can go into a whole host of other things. Laws like like CEQA, which have been abused and misused to harm and 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 
get in the way of development. That's our environmental quality law, which was designed, of course, with good intention, but has been interpreted in a, in a really problematic way. So uh, I think overall, if we're going to create a better environment in California, we need to be able to have an environment where businesses understand this is what's expected of me. And next year, we're not going to see some brand new set of regulations that's going to make it harder for me to do business here in California. Thank you so much. So when you ran for state controller last year, you emphasized the importance of full transparency in state spending and finances. Um, have we made any progress in this regard? And are there examples you can give us of why full transparency for spending is so important? Yeah, we, we haven't. Uh, you know, so as some of you know, I, I ran for California state controller in 2022. Uh, and that campaign, you know, the controller of California is the person who is supposed to give taxpayers a sense of where their money is going. Okay, we actually have a job and, and the people who drafted the constitution of our state felt it was important enough to have an independent position, somebody who was not reporting to the governor, not reporting to any other politician in the state, but reporting directly to the taxpayers to give taxpayers a sense for, hey, where's all this tax money going? And unfortunately, for decades, we've had basically a, a placeholder in that job, somebody who uh, didn't care all that much about giving taxpayers the information they deserve. And so when I ran for controller, the promise I made to voters and to people that I saw on the campaign trail every day was we're going to make sure that you have, as taxpayers, the accountability you deserve. Um, here's some things that people don't realize about California. So we spend $300 billion a year as a state. We're the only state in America where you don't have to give people a complete transparent audit of where that money goes. Think about that for a minute. Only state in the country. Even in Illinois, you know, they got governors sitting in prison for fraud and former governor. They have more transparency than we have in California. So the case I'd make to people is we can't keep doing this. And, and you see the outcomes that we have in our state as a result. We, we spend so much money on things that we frankly have no idea where the money goes and whether those projects will ever be finished. Think about um, the high-speed rail project that we've heard a lot about. Okay? Um, we've managed to build about eight miles of track in the Central Valley between two places which are wonderful communities. But they're not the size of any of the communities here. They're not the size of Riverside or San Bernardino or Fontana or Upland. They're not the size of any of these communities. And we have no transparency around that, except we know that a lot of money's gone to foreign contractors who aren't delivering. I'll give you another example. Many of you are familiar with the unemployment insurance fraud, the EDD fraud that happened through the pandemic, when our tax dollars got taken by people who ended up being part of criminal syndicates in China and India and Russia. Some of that money is probably funding Russia's war in Ukraine right now. And there was nobody who blew the whistle on that. And still, to this day, this governor has not fixed that program. That, that program, we had a report from the legislative auditor just last week. There was a write-up on it in the LA Times. And the, the auditor said, we still haven't fixed this program. So the, the idea of fiscal transparency and knowing where the money goes and having an effective auditor, this is really important stuff. I, I understand that it doesn't grab headlines a lot of the times. It seems really boring. It's like, we want that job. But for me, at least during that campaign, it was important to make the point that we need somebody who can actually do the job in a way that creates accountability. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, your, your question was, has it gotten better? No, I think it's gotten worse. Uh, and I think that the leadership in Sacramento, unfortunately, just doesn't care a whole lot about where our tax dollars go because they think that there are endless amounts of it and they spend as though there are endless amounts. Right. And so on that note, um, I think uh, residents of San Bernardino County felt the same, which is why in uh, 2022 they voted in favor uh, for measure double E, which is an accountability factor aimed at, you know, delivering those receipts. How are these tax dollars, at least for uh, the counties and the cities being distributed? Are we getting our fair share, so to speak, yeah. right? Because we pay all of this tax money to the state, but if it's not being um, equitably uh, distributed, then that's a problem, especially with, as I'm sure you are aware of, uh, growing unfunded mandates yeah. and a population growth, especially in our region, right? Um, and so I'm very proud of, of San Bernardino County for doing that and for initiating that at least uh, first line of accountability, right? right. 
Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens of that. I know uh, a committee has been formed and they're going to start uh, examining uh, documents, uh, gathering data to uh, determine where those shortcomings are first identified. Well, unfortunately, uh, this is often how government does business, which is to pass on unfunded mandates. And we see it from the federal government passing on unfunded mandates to the states and then the states passing them on to localities. I was speaking to a sheriff during my campaign for Southern California County, and he was telling me, do you know how much I have to spend out of the county's budget to provide security in our in our courthouses? And it's money that I'm supposed to be getting from Sacramento. I'm not getting that money. I still need to deliver to keep our courthouses, our court personnel, our judges, our our, our bailiffs, every we got to keep them all safe. But that's money out of my budget that you're expecting me to pay. So the accountability for what's happening at the local level is important. And we had a lot of innovative things happening in our cities and our counties around California. I know there's a couple of folks in the room who are part of city government. Thank you for doing that, by the way, because you're the first line of defense and you're the first line of, you know, when stuff goes wrong, people are knocking on your door because they know where you live, right? That's and, and that's the reality of, of what we have is a situation where our local and state, uh, mostly our local officials, are having to pick up the pieces when the state's not doing its job. And uh, one example of that, of course, is the lack of accountability that you mentioned, uh, deeply problematic. All right. So um, let's talk about policy surrounding infrastructure. In California, we see water conservation commercials and the premiums that are paid for water during the driest seasons. How can we accelerate the initiation of projects designed to store and deliver water in California? Yeah, that's a great question. We've been talking about how to create more durable water storage in California to deal with the challenges we have. I mean, we live in a potentially challenging climate. Now, we actually had a very healthy winter. We had a good snowpack. We had a number of very positive environmental factors. We were blessed with a fair amount of rain. The problem is we don't have any way of storing this water and we don't have any way of conveying water either, right? So you get a lot more water in the north. We have a lot of utilization needs in the south. How do we get the water from north to south and do it in a way that, by the way, helps our farmers and ranchers in the Central Valley? They need water as well, okay? And 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 probably here, here down here in the Inland Empire as well. And so uh, I think that we have a couple of challenges at play. Number one is um, there's a failure to recognize that this water challenge is solvable. Uh, there's a lack of creativity, but we continue to have our politicians saying, we're going to solve the problem, we're going to solve the problem, but nobody actually steps up to get it done. And there have been a number of creative ideas. You know, Jerry Brown had this idea to build two tunnels to convey water uh, through the Delta. Uh, Gavin Newsom wants to do one tunnel. Whatever the idea is, it, at this point, it almost doesn't matter what the idea is. Let's just go and get it done. The second thing, to be quite honest, I think the challenge we have with building more durable storage in California uh, is this issue of uh, how powerful the environmental lobby has gotten. And many of you may be aware that a lot of this development of water storage is being held up by concern about a very small fish called the Delta smelt. And literally, this small fish species, species is what has prevented a lot of that construction particularly on the north side of the San Joaquin Valley, where we want to start that storage and, and that conveyance. Now, look, it's important for us to protect our environment. I get that. But at some level, you have to ask, what is the prioritization of all these things? And can we really allow environmental litigation to block the construction of what is necessary, water storage and conveyance, for years and decades of time? It is the abuse of California's environmental laws that I think is, is greatly concerning when it comes to this issue of conveyance. I'll just add two other things, which is we've got technology available to us to do things like desalinate and recycle water. So, you know, we've got a ton of water in, in the ocean. Can we take that water and figure out a way to actually use it so it can work for us for drinking and for agricultural needs? It's not cheap, but building water infrastructure isn't cheap either. So let's figure out a way to use all of the resources we have at our disposal to create a more stable water supply for our state. We, we have to figure out how we do that because Water is one of those issues that uh, is, it should be solvable, but it's, it hasn't been solved. So also, uh, Dr. Chen, you were selected by the Obama administration to serve on the Bipartisan Social Security Committee. Uh, please share a bit about your efforts and whether collective or individual efforts identified a better pathway forward. And if so, what would that look like? 
Well, we had a great conversation at our table about, about social security. And, and as many of you know, um, the challenge with social security is we actually know what we have to do to solve it. But like water, no one wants to step up and actually get it done. So what, what's the basic problem? The basic problem is right now we got a lot of people drawing from the program and relatively fewer workers who are paying into the program. And so as a result, there is a something we call the trust fund in Social Security. And that trust fund has kind of dwindled over time. And many of you uh, may be aware of this, but when that trust fund runs to zero, which is estimated to happen in the next seven to nine years, when that goes to zero, what the federal law actually says is you got to cut everyone's benefits by 20%. Doesn't matter how much you make, doesn't matter what your income level is, doesn't matter what your station in life is, you're going to get your benefits cut. And so the idea that we can keep going on without addressing or solving the problem to me is madness. Uh, a lot of people depend on Social Security, but a lot of younger Americans and a lot of people in this room probably have saved for their own retirement. So we need to be encouraging people to do both to save for retirement, but also to solve the social security crisis. And it's eminently doable, right? There's a combination of things we can do. I'll give you one example. There are a lot of people who are very, very well off. How about we figure out how we grow benefits more slowly for people who are well off than for people who are not well off? And I think most people would agree, hey, that's not a bad idea. You know, if I've got the means and I've, I've saved for myself, I'm willing to see my benefits grow a little more slowly. And that way, we don't have to increase taxes, right? We don't have to cut benefits for everybody. So there, there are ways that we can solve this problem. But um, again, no one has the guts to, everyone wants to say, I don't talk about Social Security. But it's a problem that's looming, and it's a problem that we're going to have to solve. And if we don't, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to be hurt. Right. And as you mentioned, you know, for those that are more well off, uh, maybe a good counterbalance to that would be to reduce their taxes, right? So they're not paying into Social Security, sure. yeah. and that offsets the fact that they're prepared and they're going to be set for their retirement, and maybe it's not as important for them to pay into the Social Security. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, people who paid in have every expectation that they they get something out. That's that's a deal, right? And and part of the reason why, if you look at your paycheck, there's a line item on that tax collection for Social Security taxes. If you pay those taxes in, you deserve to get them out. That's a, that's a promise made that should be a promise kept. That having been said, what happens over time, of course, is that the system gets out of balance. And that's where we are now. We're in a situation now where there is no balance in the system. Uh, and again, these are solvable problems. It's not, it's not like rocket science where we got, you know, are finding a cure for cancer. We just, it's going to take a lot of research and work. This is not hard. All the answers have been known by policymakers for decades. Um, the last president to have the guts to take this on was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan took this on in 1983. A guy named Alan Greenspan, who ran the Federal Reserve, he appointed him the chairman of the committee. They figured out what to do about Social Security, and they were able to fix the problem. But now, unfortunately, that fix is not going to be enough going forward. So someone's got to have the guts to step up and, and get it done. Perfect. Thank you. So also, um, what are your thoughts on the exits of two major insurance companies from California, and what do the long-term impacts look like? Is there policy that should be implemented to ensure affordable and accessible insurance for Californians in their wake? I, I think that when insurance companies make the decision not to do business in California, it is the result of uh, very predictable and tangible policy decisions made by the state. Can't blame the insurance companies. Like every other uh, industry in this country, uh, they have shareholders to respond to, and they have a business to. Them. And if you create a business environment that does not allow an insurance company to operate in, in, in a way that works for them, they have every right to exit that market. Now, the, the exits that we've seen in California are happening for a number of different reasons. First of all, there are regulatory issues with respect to how insurance is regulated in the state that make it exceedingly difficult for some insurance companies to do business here. The second thing is there are some parts of our state that are very difficult to insure for a number of different reasons. There are risk factors, there are hazards involved, and there are things a state probably needs to do in order to create a healthier insurance market in those parts of our state that the state has not been. And frankly, we've got an insurance commissioner who I think is a state of the year, all right? We have, we're one of the few states that has an insurance uh, separate elected insurance commissioner. We have a department of insurance, we have an insurance commissioner, who 
uh, you know, unfortunately is more concerned with politics than people. And, you know, again, it's I don't want to make this a political statement, but fundamentally, you need to have people who have some expertise in insurance running the regulation of insurance in the state. And he has not had that. He has not demonstrated that. And it's unfortunate. You know, for many years, we've actually had insurance commissioners who knew what they were doing. And, and unfortunately, uh, we're not in that situation in California right now. So I, I think that there's a tendency in the media to, to make this, well, it's the fault of businesses who exit the state. There are a lot of businesses who decide, I don't care if it's insurance or somewhere else, we can't do business in California. And that is a very fair assessment. We need to do what we can in California and in our communities to make this a better place for businesses to want to succeed and grow. Because for many years, businesses did want to start in California. They did want to grow in California. We don't have that environment anymore. I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people involved in early stage companies and venture capital. And I can't tell you the number of people who say, you know, I'd rather start my company in Utah or Idaho or Arizona or Nevada. I even have people say to me, this is crazy. I'd rather start it in New York than in California. What does that tell you about the environment we have in our state? So, um, you know, again, it gets back to your first question, which is a very good one. How do we create a better business environment in the state? Right. And so where would you say the low-lying fruit would be to um, make this a more more uh, friendly place to, for those insurance companies, right? Uh, when you talk about uh, safety, uh, forestry, um, well, you know, yeah. those type of Yeah, things. we, you know, we, if you look at forestry management as an example, right, we've got a wildfire problem in the state. And some of that's because of the nature of our terrain, the nature of our climate. There's all sorts of reasons why we have this risk, but we have it. It's not an unpredictable risk. It's a predictable risk. And so there are things, for example, I, you know, I was talking to um, Assembly Member James Gallagher, who's the Republican leader, and he represents a district that's very rural and has a, a, you know, some forest, forestry concerns and issues, along with a few of his other neighboring districts up there. And what I've been told is that we have ways of managing that buildup that this governor is not doing. Uh, we have ways of ensuring that we're investing in CAL FIRE and in other agencies that are responsible for helping to deal with disaster preparedness and response, and we're not doing that. So the, the, the low-hanging fruit, I think, is to make sure we're managing what we can manage. There's a lot of things out of our control. If we get a windstorm of epic proportions, that's going to happen. There's nothing we can do about that, okay? But we can prepare for that eventuality by making sure that we're doing what we need to do, by making sure that the public utilities are, are preparing appropriately so that they're doing the maintenance they need to do when that stuff is perfect. All right, everybody, we're heading on a break. So Yvette Walker here with ABC News and Talk, Southern California Business Report with a California public policy update with Dr. Lanny Chen, a veteran of several high profile U.S. political campaigns and served as policy director for Governor Mitt Romney's 2012 bid for the presidency, a senior appointee at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services during the George W. Bush administration and appointed by the Obama administration to serve on the Bipartisan Social Security Committee when we return. Hi, Ray Lance from the Diamond Center in the Claremont Village here. One of the coolest parts of a third generation family business is getting to know the families we serve through generations. Once you experience our friendly service, our fair and transparent pricing, and our beautiful jewelry that we make to last a lifetime, you'll stick with us too. Come visit us in the Claremont Village or at Lance, L-A-N-T-Z, DiamondCenter.com and see what makes us different. Cal State San Bernardino is home to the only school of entrepreneurship in California. With globally ranked degree programs, you can start your journey today to become a successful entrepreneur. Learn more and connect at entre.csusb.edu. Hi, I'm Dana Rademacher with MGR Property Management. A lot of people wonder about the value that property management has for their property. 
Property management can include all property types, including residential, commercial, and HOA. It is valuable because property managers are experienced in what can happen at your property. We're aware of liabilities. We're able to do predictive and preventative maintenance. We know what is coming up with the changes in the weather, the seasons, how old certain aspects or different capital projects at your property are. We're able to best negotiate contract pricing, legalities with your tenants, and anything else that you may need to ensure that you're getting the full value of the property. If you're interested in speaking with a representative at MGR Property Management regarding your property management needs, you can visit our website at mgrrealestate.com or you can call our number at area code 909-581-6600 to be connected with a representative. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Hi, I'm San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus. If you're looking to start an exciting career in law enforcement and make a difference in your community, we are hiring. Dispatchers, nurses, deputies, laterals, and many more. For a complete list of our jobs and more information, visit sheriffsjobs.com. Welcome back, everyone. Yvette Walker with ABC News and Talk Southern California Business Report with California Public Policy Update and Dr. Lan He Chen, a veteran of several high profile U.S. political campaigns and served as policy director for Governor Mitt Romney's 2012 bid for the presidency, a senior appointee at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services during the George W. Bush administration, and appointed by the Obama administration to serve on the Bipartisan Social Security Committee. Thank you again for being with us, Dr. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, so prior to the break, we discussed uh, insurance companies, infrastructure and how to create a friendly economic development uh, landscape for the business community. Um, what are your thoughts on minimum wage policy in California and the impact it has for organizations looking to stay competitive and viable in a strained economic environment? An example would be the proposed increase of minimum wage for healthcare workers, which would translate to a $2 billion in cost increases for California hospitals and ultimately to patients. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the um, minimum wage, rent control, you know, a lot of these sort of efforts to intervene in markets, uh, if, if you just go back to basic economics, they tend to distort markets. They tend to make it more challenging for example, in the case of rent control, over time, what happens is that you restrict the amount of available supply. And so what it does in the long run is it makes a lot of other housing more expensive and it makes it hard to get access to that housing. The minimum wage has a similar effect. Now, we have made a decision as a society that there needs to be a certain level of wage that people are paid. And that, that you know, it's a fine decision that we make. The challenge is at what point does raising that minimum wage create a, a, a challenge for hiring? Does it create a challenge for the system more broadly? You mentioned healthcare. That's a great example. I spent a lot of my time thinking about healthcare issues and, and some of the challenges we face in our state and our country. And you're right that unfortunately, at the end of the day, what increasing the minimum wage too significantly in the healthcare context means is that patients pay more. Because all of that cost gets passed through. For most healthcare systems, the single biggest cost input is labor. And you know, that's we obviously want quality labor. I'm uh, for many years I was the chairman of a healthcare system in Northern California. And for us, competing for and making sure that you have the highest quality labor, that's really important. It's hard to do it though when the conditions are created such that uh, that labor cost becomes prohibitively high. And so I do have concerns about legislation or regulatory efforts 
that would further increase the minimum wage in a way that's out of step with what the current marketplace is, what the labor market currently means. And the other thing is, frankly, it, it makes us less competitive to state. So if you look at the level of what the minimum wage is here versus in other states, it should not be surprising that job creation is healthier and stronger in other states versus in California. So I think those are those are challenges. Now, the reason that's given for a higher minimum wage is, well, people can't afford to live in California. Otherwise, they can't afford to buy things here. I fully agree that we have an unaffordable environment in California. We have dumb policies, again, that have made it very hard to build new houses, that have made it very, very hard for us to develop cost-effective energy. Why is gas two or three dollars more a gallon here than other states? All of these things make living in California less affordable. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the challenge? Is the challenge that we need a higher minimum wage or that we need policies to make California more livable and affordable? And there are two sides of every coin. So it's easy enough for people to say, okay, you don't want a higher minimum wage. You must really hate workers. And that's not the answer. The answer is, how do we make it easier for workers to live and thrive and raise families? And nobody's tending to that side of the equation in California. Right. So... In addition, we have heard uh, of recent efforts to revive the movements towards single payer healthcare in California. Um, and many powerful interests in Sacramento, including the California Nurses Association, have expressed support for this sort of change. What do you think of these efforts? And more importantly, are these changes likely to happen? Uh, I, I don't know if they're likely to happen. I'm, I'm concerned that they could. I think that there is a political environment right now that has made these kinds of single payer type solutions very popular. So just to back up for a minute, the concept of single payer healthcare is basically having the government take over all the healthcare system. So I like to ask people, how do you think the DMV is working? Do you want that dynamic in your healthcare system? Now, there's a lot of things about our healthcare system that aren't perfect. I get that. A lot of things still cost too much. We need access to better physicians. We need more doctors and providers. We need to be allowing nurses to do more places. There's lots of things we got to do with our healthcare system. But is the answer really to put the people who are in charge of the DNB in charge of your healthcare? That to me doesn't make a lot of sense. But that is what single payer is fundamentally. Single payer means we're going to get all the businesses out of healthcare. We're going to get all of the people who are really involved in the healthcare system now and get them out. And we're going to create a brand new healthcare system that somehow is going to be better. You guys remember many years ago uh, when we were having the discussion over Obamacare, uh, President Obama said, if you like your health care, you can keep it. That turned out to be untrue. If you if you like your health care, you really won't be able to keep it if we have this single payer system come in. Because what that's going to mean is that government's going to become the sole insurer. Government's going to become the sole employer of physicians and nurses. Government's going to become the sole place where you go to get everything. And we, we see how that works, by the way, because there are other countries that have single payer systems. They have it in Canada. They have it in the United, in the United Kingdom and the UK. And how many of you know people who go to Canada to get health? Not many. They may go to Canada for cheap prescription drugs. That's a different issue. But they don't go to Canada to get an MRI. They don't go to Canada to get heart surgery. People from Canada come here. So if you have a single payer health care system, what you are going to do is you are going to destroy all of the great things about our healthcare system, the innovation. This is the best. If, if you have a complicated healthcare situation, this is the best place in the world to get it treated. We have a system that's incredibly innovative. We're deploying technology at an incredibly rapid rate. The adoption of artificial intelligence in the healthcare setting, which is scary sometimes, but also remarkable in others. We have all that here in America. And you want to throw that all away to give government more power and more influence. To me, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and this idea that you can have health care for cheaper and you can have more health care if the government takes it over, that's untrue as well. <clears throat> because how does all this stuff get paid for? By taxes. So if you look at other states that have tried single payer, other states have tried it. Vermont's a great example. In Vermont, they wanted to have single payer health care. You know what happened? They couldn't afford it. They figured out the numbers didn't work, but they'd have to raise taxes to 80, 90 percent to make the math work. It, 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 it's just not practical. Okay, so I get that it sounds good. It's great for a bumper sticker. But if you really step back and you say, what are the good things about our healthcare system? What are the things we want to preserve and protect about our healthcare system? Going to single payer doesn't do anything. So, you know, I, I do worry because it's so easy for people. 
to just say, oh, it's much easier. Get the middlemen out of there, cut the costs. And that's the, that's the sort of siren song of single payer government and health care. But at the end of the day, none of those promises end up coming to fruition. We see it over and over again. And if we don't learn from history, then we're idiots because we know what the history has told us about what single payer health care looks like in so many different places. Absolutely, Dr. Chen. They say those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat yeah, it, and well, we don't want to repeat those. That's right. Those things, mistakes. Those yeah. mistakes. Um, so, fentanyl is an epidemic in schools and throughout our greater community. What laws are being drafted to combat the impacts of such a deadly substance? Well, here's the thing about fentanyl. There's a couple of issues that that we have to deal with. All right. Number one is we're not supporting law enforcement. All right. We have a lot of laws already that enable law enforcement to deal with the challenge. They're not being enforced. I talked to my friend who's a district attorney in Sacramento County. He's actually suing the city of Sacramento for a lot of things that the city of Sacramento is not allowing their law enforcement to do. They're not giving them the tools to make sure that they can appropriately fight this crisis. And it is a crisis that we have in our state. So number one is supporting law enforcement, making sure that they have all the tools that they need to address the challenge, making sure they're properly funded, this notion of defunding the police is the most ridiculous concept. And, and you know, I, what I hear from my friends on, on the progressive left is, well, that doesn't exist anymore. I still hear about it all the time in San Francisco. and play. I still hear about efforts to minimize funding to law enforcement. It's, it's just it's ludicrous. If you look at the number of challenges we have, which we'll talk about in a little bit, the homelessness challenge, there's all sorts of crises. But on fentanyl particularly, we need to be supporting law enforcement. That's one. Number two is we got to get real about the border crisis. All right, this is a national federal issue. We have uh, illicit drugs. We have people coming across the border, essentially uncontrolled. You look at what's happening in the city of New York right now. The mayor there, the, the, the Democrat mayor is calling out the Democrat president because he is saying, you're not doing enough to address what's happening in the border. And this is a federal issue. The federal government's primary responsibility is to ensure the sanctity of the borders of our country. And that is not being done right now. And so if you look at the fentanyl crisis, you look at the amount of fentanyl and other illicit drugs that are being trafficked across our southern border. You look at the people that are being trafficked, who are being trafficked across our southern border. Uh, this is a crisis, I believe, of epic proportions. It is going to destroy once great cities like New York and San Francisco and L.A., uh, and we're not doing anything about it. So um, as much as we do need the proper legislative tools to make sure that we're doing everything we can, we got a lot of tools at our disposal we are not using. And this crisis is becoming a crisis that's affecting too many families in too many parts of our state. And, you know, it doesn't seem to be a priority for people, but we really need to figure out how to address this challenge. And it's linked up with challenges around public safety, mental health. There's all sorts of issues that we need to be talking about that we're not talking about. Right. Uh, with that said, public policy in the classroom has been a hot topic. Uh, what are some public policy updates surrounding education we should be paying attention to? Uh, in, in the field of education, there's a couple of issues that we're encountering right now. And many of you are familiar with it because we're seeing these battles fought in our, our local schools all over California. And, and that is this question of uh, who really, at the end of the day, gets to control a student's education? Is it parents or bureaucrats? And in too many cases for too many years, the default answer in too many parts of our state has been bureaucrats, not parents. And particularly during the, the COVID time, a lot of parents got fed up with it. And they said, listen, I, you're not, you're not going to keep asserting control when really I get to have a say in what my kids are learning in schools. And so uh, the first issue that we're having in our education system now is a real struggle, I think, over where that locus of control really sits. Does it sit with parents in the community or does it sit with unfortunate bureaucrats? Uh, and, and I think that battle is going to continue to be played out. And, and we see it, you know, we see the state battling localities sometimes. Um, and, and listen, every school district is going to have a slightly different view of what needs to be taught to students in that district. That is the way our system works. So if you live and work in San Francisco and you send your kids to San Francisco schools, there are some basic standards we should expect of all students in our state. They need to be able to write. They need to be able to do math. They need to be able to identify what the capital of our state and country are. Those are really important things. But in San Francisco, what is taught kids there is probably going to be different 
than in communities around here. And that's okay. We need to allow for that. And the idea is not to standardize things. The idea is to exert more local control. I've always been a big believer that what's needed in education is more local control. That's item number one. Item number two, I think, is uh, we need to be creating more optionality in education. That's why I'm such a big believer in school choice. And this is a single most significant issue, I think, of the next generation. Is are we going to allow families to be able to choose the educational arrangements that work best for their kids, whether it's a public school, a public charter school, a private school, a parochial school, a religious school, whatever that might be. We need to be giving uh, families the opportunity to make that choice. And dollars, education dollars, particularly at the federal level, need to follow the student. So we need to be able to allow students and families to make those choices, not, again, education bureaucrats. There's a whole bureaucracy that's grown up in Washington and Sacramento around our education system. And unfortunately, in too many cases, uh, that doesn't really meet the needs of people. So we really have two very different conversations going on in education. We have what I call the industrial education complex in Sacramento. And there's a lot of groups that are part of that. They think the status quo is working just fine. And they want to keep pushing for that. And then there are folks out there who really want to push for things like parental choice. They want to push for things like local control, school choice, dollars for all students, these ideas I've talked about. And that is going to be, I think, a fundamental fissure in our education system and in debates over education policy in our state for years to come. And, and I, I don't know what side is going to come out on top, I'll be honest with you. I think that is one of the things that I find most scary. I have two school-aged children myself. And, and we've made a series of decisions about our kids' education because in our area, uh, we didn't have in-person school for two years because of COVID. It's ludicrous. We had a whole generation of kids falling behind, not learning basic skills, not knowing how to interact with other people, other human beings, because we made decisions um, that I think are, are going to create massive economic issues in the future. We, we, there have been some studies done, you know, e- even by the conservatives at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm joking. Uh, they, they, you know, even they found that what policies we had during COVID are going to cost, uh, create massive economic costs for our state and our country in terms of what kids are learning, in terms of what they're going to be able to do. And, you know, we've done, these are all self-inflicted groups, uh, and, and it's sad to see. Absolutely. Um, in your view, is California policy aligned with the broader nation's tone? I hope not. <laughs> Please hope give not. examples of how major policies are the same or different. Uh, well, I, I, I do think you're seeing, um, I alluded in healthcare, for example, to efforts to exert more government control. And I think, unfortunately, over the last couple of years, uh, we have seen more alignment uh, between Sacramento and Washington over this idea that government should have more control over various sectors of the economy. We see it in energy development. That's a great example. We haven't talked about energy yet, but look at how hard it is to develop energy here in California, how much we have pushed energy exploration and refinement outside of the state of California. This idea that it makes more sense for uh, energy to be harvested in Venezuela than in California is crazy. Let's do it here in California. We know how to do it affordably and safely as opposed to doing it somewhere else. And yet there is such a strong bias against developing energy here in California and in the United States. We've seen it in California. Now we have an announcement from the Biden administration that massive parts of Alaska are off limits to energy exploration. It's madness, all right? I'm not saying go kill a bunch of polar bears. What I am saying is we know how to do it responsibly. We know there are parts of the Arctic a National Wildlife Refuge where, where there can be responsible development of energy. Why are we not doing it here in America? Why are we not leaning on our partners in Canada and Mexico to help us? Why are we outsourcing this to the Saudis and the Venezuelans? It makes no sense. And so. We need to be figuring out how to create better alignment, in my view, on smart policy, on energy, between what's happening in California and Washington. Unfortunately, D.C. and Sacramento are very synced up on this topic right now, but in a bad way. You know, and, and I think in, in, in other ways, we see things that are very out of step in California. Um, you know, we see, as I noted earlier, how hard it is to develop new infrastructure here, how long it takes to get things built. A lot of that trend is very off trend with what's happening in the rest of the country. So um, there are things about California that will always be different. We have to acknowledge that. It is always probably going to, you know, we're going to have to pay more for gas in California than everywhere else. We're we're never going to be like Florida in that way. 
And, and that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of it. And I think a lot of people would say, okay, you know, I'll pay a little bit because I recognize these are priority, but I don't want to pay double or triple. You have to really understand what's happening. And um, that alignment that we see, unfortunately, is alignment in the wrong areas. I'd like us to see more alignment in areas where we like what's happening in California. We don't like what's happening elsewhere. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the trends are not moving in a good direction. Do you believe there are any changes that will happen politically in Sacramento as we look towards the 2024 election? Um, you know, I wish I could say the answer was yes. You know, I, I um, during my campaign last year, uh, I spent a lot of time and energy reaching out to all parts of California because I felt like we had a message that all Californians would agree with. And, you know, we, we, we did make progress on that message. We managed to win in a lot of places that people from my party have not won in a long time. Because I do think there's a lot of Californians who are pretty fed up. Honestly, if you ask people, you put the politics aside, you put all the debates over culture aside, you ask them, do you really think the state's working for you? Most Californians will say no. They don't believe it's working. And at some point, that will translate to new leadership in Sacramento and new leadership elsewhere. I don't know when that's going to happen. I, I wish I could be more optimistic and say 2024 is going to be the year when Sacramento, it's just you know, we, we've dug ourselves a pretty big hole, but that doesn't mean we don't keep working. I see a lot of great people who are fighting and working here locally, who are you know standing for election, who are trying to do the right things. Um, I, I urge people to continue to do that because we do have an opportunity, I think, to change the landscape, but it's not going to happen. With them. And, and it's going to require a lot of effort and a lot of time explaining to people. That's the thing I found most often when I was on the campaign trail is, you know, people just want to understand what's going on. In your state, and they want to know what decisions have been made that makes their lives harder, and they're ready to vote against that. Like, they're ready to turn that stuff out, but you got to get to them and convey a message that's focused on the issues that folks care about. And at the end of the day, what most Californians want is they want to be able to raise their families in a safe community and do it in a way that doesn't break the bank. It's very simple. And you know, the more we don't talk about those things, I think the harder we make it politically for ourselves. So speaking of that, what would you say you're most excited and encouraged about as we do look at the 2024 elections? Well, you know, we got a lot of big elections on the horizon, you know, in, in, including who's going to lead our country. And I think it's a very meaningful election. Today. And people are going to be involved and engaged. But I, I would say what, what's most exciting to me, I wish I could say it's what's happening in Sacramento. I wish I could say it's happening in Washington. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff happening in D.C. A lot of people don't get along. And you know, they're talking about shutting down the government again. It's crazy, right? But but I do think that what gives me the most hope is what's happening in our communities. The leadership that we're seeing developed and conveyed at the local and regional level is really where I think things are happening in our state and in our country. That's what's most exciting to me. Um, I think there's also a number of really important races in Congress as I look around. There's a, a right here in Southern California will be the epicenter of some really competitive congressional races. Uh, one in the Coachella Valley, a couple down in Orange County, uh, a couple in, in L.A. County, in Ventura County. They're going to be very, very important. So we're going to be watching those closely. And, and I do think that there are going to be opportunities for everyone to get involved. And I hope people do. But um, it, it's hard to look at our politics right now and say we feel great about what's happening. But that doesn't that's not an excuse for people not to stay involved. And, and I know that all the business and, and political leaders in this room probably listening will stay involved uh, but it's a big challenge right now i mean i you know, my wife and i talk often about our politics she said i don't know how you do it like i don't know why you know how you did it i don't know why you'd ever want to do it again the reality is if if people aren't willing to step up and try and make these changes we're going to be stuck with this leadership that's not working and we, we, we've got to figure out a way to turn the tide so that does leave me optimistic whether it's 2024 or beyond i do think at some point the state will turn Beautiful. Well, um, thank you so much for sh sharing your time with us, Dr. Chen, for your insight um, and uh, good luck on your race moving forward. Well, I'm not a candidate now, which is I'm thankful for that. But good, good luck to anybody who's involved in the race and, and uh, you know, all the best. All right. Perfect. For everybody listening, don't miss USA versus Mexico men's and women's indoor soccer game at the Toyota Arena in Ontario, Sunday, September 10th at the Toyota Arena, located at 4000 East Ontario Centre Parkway. The women's match starts at 1 and the men's 
match starts at 5 p.m. Visit TheEmpireStrikers.com or call 909-457-0252 for more information. Don't miss my conversation with Sheriff Dykus, who was raised in a law enforcement family and has lived in San Bernardino County for over 40 years. In high school, he was a Sheriff's Explorer Scout. After graduating, he enlisted in the United States Army and was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division, where he served as a military police officer at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Next week, we will have Dr. John T. Chapman, the President and Chief Executive Officer at San Antonio Regional Hospital in Upland. Mr. Chapman joined the hospital as Chief Operating Officer in 2018 and is currently the seventh president and CEO in the history of the hospital. You do not want to miss it. This has been the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker on KMET 1490 AM, FM 98.1, and ABC News Radio Affiliate, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Remember to visit the podcast page on the KMET website.